Next up, we have world famous Charles Hoskinson, CEO of IOHK and founder of Cardano, giving the keynote speech on Cardano 2020 development driven by science. Thank you. Give it up for Charles Hoskinson. Hi, everybody. How's everyone doing? Feeling good? A little tired? I just came in from Colorado. It took me 22 hours to get here. I'm feeling great. <laughs> so uh, what are we going to talk about? Well, let's talk about where we, where we came from and uh, where we're probably going. That's a good way to kick off the day. So when I entered the space a long, long time ago, oh, it's actually almost eight years now. It's 2011. Uh, at that time, the only groups of people that were in the cryptocurrency space were criminals, crazy people, and idealists. And we're all probably a mixture of those three groups. Uh, my first meetup group I signed up for, uh, only two people signed up for, myself and someone else. The other person didn't show up. So I had a lovely conversation with myself. Uh, since that time, we've witnessed uh, this grow into a global phenomena, so much so that a camel herder in Mongolia now owns Bitcoin. So, what makes it so special? Why do we care? Well, as I say often in many of my presentations, the point of our movement is to have a global conversation about the nature of commerce, identity, property, and value. See, every so often the world changes as a consequence of technological innovation. And the big innovation that's causing the world to change is really the internet and globalization. This idea that we're moving from hierarchical societies where small groups of people decide how their people will work with each other and work with the global economy to now a system where it's bottom up, where each and every person makes a decision about what they're going to own, what they're going to invest in, who they will do business with. It was inconceivable 35 years ago that someone living in Hong Kong or Australia could have business partners in 100 different countries as a small business. Now, this is a fact of life for millions of people. And the problem is that the systems that we have, the systems that sustain global commerce, were never designed for this. Compliance was not designed for this. The flow of money was never designed for this. The notion of reputation and identity, credit and insurance were never designed for this. And so when information started flowing at the speed of light, when it cost nothing to move information from one place to another, people very quickly started asking questions about how do we move value? How do we make our money work just as fast as email? Then they started asking, well, how do we innovate the entire financial industry? And then they started saying, well, what else can we innovate using this technology? So for a while, people through imitation tried to build their financial systems to look a lot like the systems that came before us. So they built these nice hierarchical things like DigiCash, David Chom and his fellows, and they said, ah, we can digitize your money as long as you trust a central third party. Then people say, well, who should we trust? They say, oh, that's a hard one. So they said, well, what if we can get rid of the central third party and we trust no one? That's kind of a new concept. See, what happens is we would like to rule the world like that, but as we get more complicated, we get more people, eventually society gets to a point where it becomes necessary for us to anoint a leader or a committee or a federation, some sort of ruling class, some sort of ruling group to take care of things. There's never been a time in human history where we've been able to coordinate on scales of millions and billions of people, but there is no leader, there is no committee, there is no group. And that's really the crux of what our industry is about. When you start stripping away all the stuff on coin market cap and the big returns and scripting away the culture and the Lambos and the alpacas and all these cool clever things and these memes. The crux of our movement is basically how do you decide how to make decisions? How do you decide how to coordinate with people all across the world, in many cases linguistically separated, geographically separated, culturally separated, and still make decisions? and still arrive at some form of consensus. That's the crux of it. And for the last 10 years, we've been running that experiment. We grew from nothing to something, something so significant that there's now tens of billions of dollars and millions of people all around the world that do nothing but think about this. If you look at the paper volume in academia, we see hundreds of papers turning into thousands of papers every year published. 
across the academic spectrum. From economics and game theory, to cryptography, to programming language design, to consensus. And these are all going through the peer review circuits. And tens of millions of dollars of research money is available from governments to continue this exploration. You see thousands of businesses, many here, been here throughout this week and next week and the week after, who work on these topics and build interesting little applications, whether it be something for gold or it be something for credit. Each and every one of these pieces is a little stone in a mosaic that builds its way up to a system that is decentralized in nature. Pretty cool. So there's a natural question to ask, well, where does this go? And there's this concept, this term that's been floated around a lot, this idea of something called a DAO. Has anybody heard of that? Decentralized Autonomous Organization? Yeah, a few people. Well, the very first paper, I think, that was ever written in, in the context of our space for this was written by Stan Larimer, Dan Larimer's father. It was called a DAC, Decentralized Autonomous Corporation. And Stan, Dan's dad, worked at SAIC, and um, I was working with him at the time uh, on Invictus Innovations. We created a product called BitShares, and uh, his dad was a, used to make drones. So he was really in love with this idea of an unmanned company. He built unmanned aircraft. He said, well, can we create a corporation where nobody's in charge, but somehow it does everything that the corporation's supposed to do? So kill the CEO, kill the board of directors, but lead it bottom up, and it does the exact same thing as if the company was real. So he wrote a little article, and then Vitalik wrote a series thereafter in Bitcoin Magazine, and then people started chasing this idea. So what is it? Well, succinctly, what a DAO is, is basically it's a way of aggregating a bunch of people together who want to follow a social contract. Just that simple. And somehow, this collection of people that follow that social contract have some sort of enforcement mechanism for it that can run. So you can think of the most obvious examples as just aggregations of capital. People get together, they put a lot of money together, there's a prospectus around that money of what it can be used for, and there's some social contract that decides how that money is to be spent. Once it's set, it runs, and it doesn't necessarily require somebody at the top to run it. Well, why do we care? Well, it turns out that if you abstract this concept and you take it to the next level, then you can start reimagining all kinds of things in society. For example, many of you own businesses. Well, you went through business registration for that. Many of you own property. Somewhere there's a ledger where those property registration lives. Many of you have to interface with a government and vote for people. Or you belong to an organization that's membership oriented, like the IACR or some business association. You have to take votes for who's in charge or how will that decision spend its funds and where will it go. Well, it turns out that this infrastructure, this concept of a DAO, could potentially be reimagined and reinvented and applied towards all of these facilities. Well, why is that meaningful? Well, here's the point. These are open source, library-driven, API-driven. They're software. And what does that mean? It means that every single time there's a major innovation, every single time someone comes up with something new, Every single time someone bundles these systems to work with the main ledgers permissioned and permissionless, all of that usually ends up in the open domain, which means you have access to it. It doesn't matter how poor you are or how rich you are. And when you look at how society changes, for example, if I was to come to you in the 1980, and I'd say, hey, I'm going to give you a device that has a map on it and a video camera on it and a camera on it. And you can run a business on it. You can accept credit card payments on it. You'd be like, this must be the most expensive device in the world. But now it's democratized. Everybody has a cell phone. Everybody has a mobile computing device. So you're able to build infrastructure on top of that. Similarly, all the work that we do in the infrastructure business for the blockchain side, what IOHK does, what Consensus does, what Block One does, all these entities, all of that generally enters the open domain, which means that these foundations we construct, you guys get to use for free. And that concept of a DAO, this idea of a decentralized organization that can allow you to curate a social contract, all of a sudden, you get to use that for free. And what does it mean? Well, it means in three years, five years, 10 years, we're gonna wake up and all of your facilities, whether you want to register property or handle an identity in Africa, to go through compliance at a bank, instead of these being bespoke, expensive SaaS products, they're just forks. You just click a button, you have it, and you parameterize it, and you decide who's in it. So for example, imagine a meetup group going to the specifics. Anne 
you want to collaboratively control a lot of money. Uh, let's say you have membership dues or something like that, and you want to decide, well, how do we spend these funds? Well, maybe the participants of this organization should do that. But not just any participants, engaged participants, people who actually show up and go to the meetings and do stuff. So imagine you could invent a beacon, and you could say, well, we're going to have a meetup, we're going to geotag it, it's on trusted hardware, and we're going to put the beacon somewhere. And then when a person shows up, if their cell phone is within proximity of it for some period of time, let's say an hour, two hours, it gives them a token. And the beacon can only mint tokens for the duration of the meetup. And you vote by how many tokens you have. This is a centralized system. It's cryptographically secure. It's going to be ridiculously easy to make. And now I've just replaced every single caucus system in the entire United States for the Republicans and Democratic Party. That same technology that can be used for a meetup group can now be used for basically deciding who gets to be the nominee for a major political party. And the cost is the same. It's all free. And you all already have access to it. You have ARM Trust Zone on your phones. If you have a Samsung phone, you have Knox. You know, if iPhones eventually are programmable with trusted hardware, Intel has SGX, these things are coming. And you can blend those systems with the systems that we construct. So then you have to start thinking, well, what else can I do with that? Well, you have a notion of identity. If you have a notion of identity, suddenly now you have a transnational system where you know who's good and who's bad, who's creditworthy, who's not creditworthy. You didn't have to go through a credit scoring agency. You didn't have to go through a government agency. It's just there. So do you really care now if the person's in Ethiopia or if the person's in Eritrea or the person's in Rwanda or Mongolia? No, not particularly. You have a metric. You say, ah, they look pretty good. And you have a peer-to-peer -peer system to move value between them, to do business with them. So all of a sudden, you're going to see trillions of dollars of locked up capital suddenly becoming liquid and moving at the speed of thought. And it's all being organized at the base level, at the decentralized level, not by top-down coordination. So that's what our movement, I think, is all about. And that's where it's functionally going, is this concept of kind of a Darwinian evolution of processes of society. And we have all these structures we've invented over the last 10 years from DAOs, uh, structures we've invented like smart contracts, which still aren't very smart. And there's a lot to do. Now, there's a cautionary tale in all of this. You see, the world is moving towards digital reality. Cash is dying. And we are increasingly moving towards algorithmic governance. Uh, we have a lot of regimes throughout the world that love the idea that they can attach a number to a person and that number is going to decide whether that person's a good person or a bad person, whether that person should be included or excluded in society. We even do this in the United States to a certain extent. If your number gets too low, it's hard to travel. You get on a TSA watch list. So as a consequence, as we look to the next five years, 10 years, 20 years, especially as AR comes in, and all of a sudden you now get the director's commentary on people because your glasses are going to have that, we have to make some decisions about privacy, and we have to make some decisions about autonomy. It's entirely possible to repurpose the technology we're building and put it in a very hierarchical way, if you desired, and have it controlled by a small handful of people who then not only have total control over your money, they have total control over your ability to do things, whether you can board a train or not, whether you can buy property or not, whether you can eat or not, whether it's legitimate to associate with you or not. So in a sense, in addition to these tools that we're building being neutral and open source and composable, they're also a great counter pushback, kind of a new concept, almost like when BitTorrent came for the music industry. We had a way of distributing content, which had worked for a while, and then some new technology came out, and it kind of turned everything on its head, and the internet invented this concept to try to change the entire reality of distribution, and it eventually won. Similarly. We have a lot of people saying big data and algorithms, these things, can be used to reinforce existing regimes and make them very draconian and make them very terrible. And our movement, in addition to making the world a better place, making the world an easier place, reducing friction, is also a way for us to fight back in a certain respect. So that's where we're going. That's what we're doing. It's going to be a crazy future. A lot of money is entering this space. A lot of money will continue entering. It's kind of funny, we say crypto winter. Guys, I've been in this space since Bitcoin was a dollar. We're almost at $4,000. You told me that I was doing something 
where it would have a 4,000 X within a decade, I'd say you're crazy. And we consider this to be the recession. So we're just getting started, you know? And uh, every metric that's reasonable is growing. And you know what? The developing world is really going to embrace this. I, uh, I'm going to Ethiopia in just two weeks. One of our classes is graduating there. If you look at the population dynamics, 70% of the country is under the age of 30. And you don't really have to have a long discussion with them to convince them that they need new money. <laughs> and most of them are familiar with cell phones, most of them are online, and most of them have used a digital currency or have a friend who's used a digital currency. That's going to be the driver of this world, 106 million person country where 70% is under the age of 30. And it's much the same throughout Southeast Asia and it's much the same throughout many of the other places in the world. So while the incumbents do have things the way they like them at the moment, within the next 20 years things are going to change very considerably and hundreds of millions of people will be entering a parallel economy. And that economy will be defined by what they do not what I do, not what the government of the United States does or China does, but what they want. And they'll have access to basically the best of everything. So thank you all for going on this journey with me, and I look forward to seeing where it goes in the next 10 years. Cheers.